Hey, little brother showed up. I have a family here today, and so they are covering over here in this whole row. And so um, Malcolm is gone, and Andrew is gone, and so I don't know how. I don't know. They leave me alone. Well, I guess Marshall's here. We're we'll just uh, do our thing for sure. That's funny. Clint is very good, uh, you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, good morning, everybody. It's obviously lovely to always come together as uh, a family. It's like we have this weekly family reunion, and that, of course, is our immediate extended family out there, um, out there in Zoom land, the cloud of witnesses, and also uh, the Brady Bunch. Uh, that we see over here. So good morning, good morning, good morning. Um, so the last several times that I've uh, shared, we've been working through the gospel as it travels through the inside, right? The good news, the proclamation of the good news uh, to all of our parts. So all the places that haven't heard, it is finished. That's what we've been talking about. And that's the gospel, right? That is the good news. It's not going to heaven when you die. It is immediately right now and present with us. And so it's that setting us free from bondage. And oftentimes it's the bondage of uh, the inner child, right? I feel like apart from healing, we have a daycare of unruly toddlers inside of us (laughs) that we have to say, shh. You know, be quiet, go to sleep, it's nap time because I'm having to be an adult over here. And then all of a sudden, don't go over there, you're going to wake up the toddlers and all these kids that, you know, all these divided parts of us that are frozen in time through either trauma or, or uh, fear or, or all these different things uh, start screaming and yelling and we're trying to just keep them down, keep them down. And a healing in the gospel, the good news, is the bringing together of those fragments, the binding up of the brokenhearted, right? Um, so that we become our true, total selves. And that's what Jesus, that's what the gospel does. The good news is the binding up of our broken heart. And so setting us free from the bondage of trauma and religion. And like I've always said, we're going to continue to stand on religion's throat until it quits breathing, right? That's what we're going to do. We're not going to let up off of that uh, thing uh, until it doesn't breathe anymore. And this, this whole thing is salvation, We come to the Eucharist, and it is uh, the blood of Christ, the cup of our salvation. That's what we say. But our understanding of salvation is that we're going to go to heaven when we die. Everything is heaven when we die. All these blessings, all these things are heaven when we die. There's a lot on the the agenda when we pass away. (laughs) we got to get through a lot of stuff if it's all over there when we die. But that's not the meaning of salvation. Salvation is a Greek word. It's called soteria. And soteria means healing. It means deliverance. It means freedom, liberation. And so when we come to say, this is the blood of Christ, the cup of your soteria, we're saying right now in this present moment today, this is the cup of your healing. This is the cup of your deliverance. Not some, it's like we keep drinking the cup of salvation when we're going to die. We're going to go to heaven when we die. Okay, we get it. But it's today, it's present, it's now. And that is what eternity is. Eternity isn't this thing that time is within. Eternity is always present forever. That's who God is forever now. He's not over there. He's not over there. He's now all the time, every time, eternally present. And so... What, uh, what I want to go into today as we continue to journey through the gospel on the inside of us, right, pulling us uh, together and, and loving us and healing us, is I, uh, the scripture I picked today is Luke 6.37. Luke 6.37, it's just one verse. Y'all know me. I don't really like to take big chunks because I struggle with just the little ones. Um, but anyway, it says, do not judge and you will not be judged. And do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. That is the scripture today. Some of y'all are thinking, oh no, (laughs) I showed up for this one. 
We're going to talk about judgment and judging one another. Let's do this. I want us to open up our family album up here, right? And go and imagine, we've all imagined Adam and Eve in the garden. So let's open it up and begin to picture what that looked like. We all have our version of what that looked like. And so we're we're going to join Adam and Eve in the garden. And the scripture says that they were naked and unashamed. Okay, I want to start there. They were naked and unashamed. That word unashamed means not disappointed. Okay, we, we, shame, we, we struggle to define it. We know when we're feeling it, but the feeling that we're feeling is disappointment. Okay, they were not disappointed. So look at that. They were just them, and they were not disappointed. Just them. Nothing extra, nothing covering them, nothing. Just them, and they were not disappointed. Because when you, we, they were bare and not disappointed. And then they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it says that their eyes were opened. And what happened? Remember, we have talked about what happened in eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is we received a conscience, Jiminy Cricket, right? We received a Jiminy Cricket speaking in our head. And that, that tree of the knowledge of good and evil... Never, you'll never have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil without a snake wrapped around it. Yeah. Need to understand that. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil always comes with Satan. And Satan all means adversary. Right? Adversary. It means uh, uh, accuser. And what does an accuser do? Well, he accuses. Right? And so we eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and we were given the ability to judge, the ability to judge, and they get right to it immediately. They, it says their eyes were open, and the first, the first thing they do is they judge one another. They, they judge the first thing they see. What's the first thing they see? Each other and themselves. And so they continue to believe the lie that they should be God. Remember, that was a temptation. If you eat this fruit... You will be like God, or you will be God. You will be Elohim. That's what the Scripture says, that you, they will be that. And they believe that lie. They believe that lie, and they saw that they are just them. And now they're considering them to be evil, right? It says that we, were, we, we saw that we were naked, so we hid ourselves. But wait a minute. You were naked right over here. <laughs> What changed? What happened? Because God over here, God is telling you, He created both male and female, and He said it's not only good, but it's very good. Very, very good. But they saw themselves, and they considered themselves evil. And so they look upon themselves, and they are, they are disappointed in what they saw because they believe that they were supposed to be something else. So they were supposed to be God. And so what happened is, is with that ability to judge and the shame came in, all of a sudden shame becomes a legal matter. Follow me with this. I know it, it hang in there. Shame becomes a legal matter. So my disappointment in that I am I am not what I'm supposed to be becomes a legal matter to become what I'm supposed to be or what I think I'm supposed to be. When all the while nothing has changed, right? Naked here, naked there. Over here, God says, very good. And over here, I say this is evil. Same thing. It's just just completely just us. And so our ability to judge, um, and that ability to judge shame became that legal matter. And the conscience that is mastered by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it lords over us legalism and judgments. The I am nots. I am not good enough. I am not. I am not. I am not. Right? It's whispering in our ear. It's always whispering, always accusing. And so what happens is our need to just be us, the very goodness. See, the deepest desire of humanity, the deepest desire of humanity is intimacy, is connection. And intimacy only comes in being able to be bare me, just me. 
You can't have intimacy while faking stuff, right? You cannot have intimacy and connection when I'm having to cover up what I'm disappointed in, right? I have intimacy when I'm able to be myself, which is vulnerable, that I have needs. And so what happens is that we then hide our needs in the law. Do you follow what I'm saying? Our needs are now hidden in the law. And so everything becomes, everything that we want, we have to deserve it. Everything that we need, everything that we desire, we have to deserve. And so we use law to get our needs met. And if you're not following the law to get my needs met, you will be judged. I will judge you. Does that make sense? And so instead of, so requests becomes, become demands. And demands, if they're not followed, there's punishment, there's judgment, right? And in reality, we can't make anybody do anything. All you could do is make them wish they did, <laughs> right? That's punishment, right? That's punishment. Punishment is I'm going to make you wish that you did what I wanted you to do to meet whatever need that I have. And I think most of us grew up with a language of labeling and comparing, demanding, pronouncing judgment on one another. Because <laughs> we have to hide our needs within the law because our needs are evil because we believe we are evil. Does that make sense? If I believe that we are inherently evil, that we have a sin nature, right? Then my needs are part of that sin nature. But the law is right. So I take my needs and desires, and I'm just going to put them right within that law and hold everybody accountable to what I need. Or, do you see what I'm saying? There's that dynamic that's taking place there. And so when people don't harmonize with that, of course, they get judged. And what that does is it places everything on the outside of us as to justify what's wrong and what's right. Right? We have these laws and we have these legalisms and all that kind of stuff. And so I'm always looking to be justified, be justified, be justified for my needs to be met. But when we are actually in touch with what we need, when we are able to be open, when we're able to be vulnerable and know what's going on on the inside of us and understanding our feelings, we don't make good slaves. We just don't. When we're able to be vulnerable, when we're be able to be open... You see, we were, we were all meant to enjoy and receive compassionately, not legally. Requests were never meant to be demands. And I think it's kind of crazy that uh, we have more words in our vocabulary to judge and label than we have to clearly describe how we feel and what we need. Right? We have all kinds of ways to judge one another and judge ourselves and be ashamed and all these things. But to actually stop, I mean, we don't even use the word feel correctly, right? We, use, we throw this word out, I feel. For instance, I feel like you don't like me. Is that a feeling? Or is that a judgment? You see what I'm saying? I feel like you don't like me. Or I feel worthless. See, these are statements of judgments. I know that's kind of, you think about it and you're going, wait a minute, that seems like a feeling to me. That's not a feeling, that's a judgment. I feel like you don't like me. Now change that phrase to really speak to feelings. It's more like I feel sad because I need to connect with you. Do you see what I'm saying? Do you see the difference in our language when we begin, begin to understand our needs and we're able to be vulnerable? We're able to show it. See, we feel as though we can't, we can't show our desires and our needs because we're not supposed to be, I am not. right? We're not supposed to be lacking. And so I'm going to fit it into the law, and I feel like you don't like me, and you're supposed to like me. right? And so I feel like you don't likely, like me. I'm needing to get my needs met, and so I'm going to say that to get you to respond to that legalism out of fear of condemnation, out of fear of shame. And so judging always divines. We blame ourselves and we blame others. And that guilt is the motivation where love creates intimacy. Love creates intimacy and we have that, we sense what our needs are. We sense what our desires are. And the same thing with others. We're able to sense and feel their desires as well and to be vulnerable and vocal about it. 
And so it's the giving of the heart that's the motivation behind love and that connection. And so love always creates that intimacy. Um, whenever we express our needs through law or judgments, other people hear criticism. And when you hear criticism, you go into, you're going to spend your energy defending yourself or counterattack, right? You're going to defend yourself or you're going to go on the attack mode. Because, shoot, if I'm already in court, I might as well have a defense, right? If you're going to drag me to court today, I'm going to bring my defense attorney with me, right? And then while we're there, shoot, since we're already in court, I might as well countersue you for breach of contract, right? You're suing me. You're saying I didn't fulfill the contract and relationship, so you're bringing me to court, and so I'm going to meet you there, and I'll do the same thing to you. Well, if you, you're saying I did that, well, that, the reason I did that is because you didn't do this. And this happens all the time in relationships. For example, if you were to, let's take me and Allison, for example. Okay, you ready, baby? All right. So, <laughs> so let's, say, let's, say, let's say that life gets really, really busy, as it often does, right? We got the kids. We got all these kind of things going on. We're running around, running around, working and making sure that all these things are done, all the, the checklist type stuff. And let's pretend, let's, let's, talk, let's use a conversation that comes out of that consciousness of good versus evil, that accuser that's in our head saying, we're not good enough, we're not good enough, but we can be if. So let's, let's put ourselves there and let's go like this. So I come home, we're doing what we need to do. We finally sit down and relax. And I could tell, let's say I could tell something is going on with Allison. She seems kind of down, you know, a little pouty maybe. And uh, I say, well, what's, are, you, are you okay? And you get the statement like, I feel like you don't love me. Right? We act like we don't say these things, but let's be honest. These are the things that we say. We say them all the time. I feel like you don't like me. Well, what is Clint here? I hear criticism. Right? I hear, feel, I hear criticism. And so the law gives me two options. Okay? Option one, I defend myself. And so I defend myself by going, I would not work this hard and slave this hard if I didn't love you. I'm bringing evidence to court, right? I'm bringing the evidence. I've done all these things. What are you talking about? Or I decide to go on a counterattack. I'm like, she's judging me for not loving her. You know what? <laughs> I'd love you more if you showed me more respect around here. <laughs> Ah, counterattack, right? Do you see how that works? Now, what's her response to my self-defense? He's, yeah. he's going into all the, you know, he's been working and do all these things. Well, she then hears that as a criticism too. And what does she say? She says, you don't think I do anything around here? <laughs> I clean the house. I, wa I, I wash the clothes. I take care of the kids. And on top of that, I do my job. You see what I'm saying? She goes into defense mode. Or she responds to my counterattack, saying that she needs to respect me, and I'll show her love. And her response is, well, respect is earned. <laughs> right? So how have you earned my respect today? Hmm. Do you see the process? We're in an adversary hearing. In fact, that's what it was called when I worked for Child Protective Services and we had to remove children because they were in danger. The hearing in which we brought the evidence was called the adversary hearing. Wow. Oh, wow. So we have an adversary, Satan, hearing going on in our relationships and in our home. And it all comes out of shame. It all comes out of a disappointment, right? So Allison could be filling these fillings or whatever, and the, the lie back there says, I should be complete in and of, of myself. I should feel connected. I should feel happy. I should, I should, I should, right? And because she's not, a lot of times we're not going to bear, we're not going to, I can't be disappointed in myself. They're the ones why I'm not getting my needs met. And so we can end up accusing other people to get my needs met because we hide our needs in the law. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? And so we use the law in our whatever way we need to, to get our needs met. And so where does it end? All this arguing, all this going back and forth, the adversary hearing, here comes the judge to make the, fall, fall, uh, the, the final ruling. And she says something like, you don't love me. See what I mean? That When we're talking about condemnation, that is the gavel. Boom. Judgment can be that word, you know, I feel like, I feel like I'm bringing evidence. I have the evidence to feel, you know, 
And the gavel comes down and says, you are guilty. You do not love me. And I say, well, you do not respect me. And there's the conversation. And at no point do we actually get down to our real desires and our real needs because we haven't been able to be vulnerable because we have this disappointment that we're not, suppo- we're not who we're supposed to be. Something other than human, vulnerable, needy, right? In my weaknesses, uh, that's where you find the strength of the Lord, right? His strength is perfected in my weakness. I'm meant to receive. I'm meant to need. But we, because we think we're evil, this thing, right? Going, you're a piece of crap. We have to then, that the law's good. Let me just try to get that need met in the law. So now take our conscience that has now been reorientated by the Holy Spirit, not to master us, but to serve the tree of life. Because that's the, the, we don't just get rid of our conscience. Our conscience is not meant to be our master. Our conscience is meant to be a servant to the tree of life. And that tree is all about sharing our desires because I can be the bare me. I can be the real me and start that same conversation over again. Something's going on. I come home with all this busyness or whatever. I could tell something's going on and she's not feeling, something's wrong with, you know, or she's not feeling uh, right or something like that. Something's up with Allison. And I walk in and say, hey, baby, what's going on? And she goes, I'm feeling sad because I miss you. Do you see the difference? I'm feeling sad because I miss you and I need to feel connected to you. (sighs) Versus I feel like you don't love me. I miss you. What does that do to me? Exactly. What happens is my heart becomes melted. And boy, I'm talking cancel everything. Right? Cancel everything. We're going on a date. We're going to go take a walk. We're going to spend time together. We're going to love on each other because you're telling me that you value me, that I, I'm someone you desire. Do you see what I'm saying? It's the moment when we say, kill the fatted calf, we're going to celebrate. That's relationship. That's me being open and honest about my feelings, but we never get down to those needs because we have a feeling and that triggers a law. Right? I have an I am not, I'm lacking here, and if I'm lacking here, i got to get my needs met through some legalism. And, the, and judgment, <laughs> judgment never, you never enjoy intimacy in judgment. It, when it, contracts don't work. And this whole relationship is about covenant. Covenant, not contract. And so what we do, a lot of our marriages and our relationships and even among groups of people, take you have, a, you have a bunch of groups of people that believe certain things and they gravitate towards each other because we all believe this, these social contracts, right? So you could take a conservative group of people. There's a social contract that's taking place that we all agree on these things. And then you can go maybe to the other side and go, you have the liberal side or the woke side or whatever. There's a social contract that's created to meet their needs, to meet their needs. There's a need there. And so if you violate the law that protects their needs, the contract, you're out. Either side, you're gone. Not only gone, we're going to execute you. Not only gone, you're Hitler. You're communist. You're all these different things. I've labeled you. I've, you're on the outside. And as Christians, as believers, those that are in Christ, we're able to see through all of that stuff and understand the needs that people are crying out for and searching for and pursuing beyond all of the fruit, beyond all of the actions, all of the rules, regulations, all that stuff. And that's who Jesus is in us and through us. The Scripture says, do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. A lot of judge, 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 judge. It's all complicated, so let's not do it, right? It says, by the the standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Mm. Wow. Right? The standard of measure will be measured to you. Does that mean, did it say God's doing any of that? It doesn't. It doesn't say any of that. 
What happens is if I hold you accountable, Stephen, let's say I hold you accountable to some rules and regulations. Well, guess what? I'm part of that contract too. There's two parties. And so I'm holding you accountable. I'm judging you. And then the accuser loves to do this and be like, well, but you didn't follow that rule either. Do you see what I mean? And I'm staying in this bondage of, of judgment and legalism. There's no relating. It's all contractual. I never connect with Stephen, right? We never enjoy real relationship because we're not going to be vulnerable. We judge one another, and here we go, round and round. Take this, for example, and this is, this is uh, for everybody, but I feel like for a lot of ladies... There is a gift that most of y'all have that y'all walk in of nourish, nourishing and a lot of times socialize that you're the, the, the greatest purpose you have is to be a caregiver, right? That is a duty that you are the, you know, you're, gonna, you're a nurturer, you're a caregiver, you don't think about your own needs, therefore you don't really know your own needs. And so what do you do to get your needs met? You have to build a case for it, Right? Uh, so instead of saying, for instance, I've had a busy day today and I'm tired and I'd like some me time, I'd like to take a bath, I'd like to go read a book or do whatever it is that blesses me, instead of saying that, you, kind of the words come out like a legal case. You know, I haven't had a moment to myself today. I cleaned the whole house, I did the laundry, made dinner, and was still able to do my job. I did all of this stuff. I've kept the law and now I deserve she lives under judgment. She has to justify a very real need. That's not relationship. That is not love. And we live under this stuff. Do you see what I mean? We can't just have a need. We have to justify it under the law. We have to have earned it. Mary and Martha, right? Yeah. Mary is seated at the feet of Jesus, right? She's, she's seated there with Jesus. Y'all know the story. Anyway, she's sitting there. She's listening to Jesus. She's receiving, you know, what Jesus has to say just right there. Martha's in the kitchen, and she's she's making dinner, and she's cleaning up, and she's clamoring. You know, she's just running around, running around, and she sees Mary, and what happens? Judge not lest you be judged, right? She's looking at Mary and saying, what is she doing? She doesn't deserve that. She hasn't done all this. She hasn't done, she hasn't helped with the cooking. She hasn't helped with the cleaning. She hasn't helped with any of this stuff. You know, Martha could be doing that same stuff out of a heart of freedom and love because cooking and cleaning and doing all that stuff wasn't wrong, right? It wasn't wrong. But she's living according to some idea that she has to earn relationship with Jesus and places, so she's already judged herself, and out of that judgment comes the judgment of Mary. What the hell are you doing? You're just sitting there, and there's things burning on the stove over here. Do you see how that works and how that plays off? And really, y'all, I want y'all to know it is so important. We have feelings that come from needs, but we never go to the need and look at it. We have feelings, and we go right to judgment. I feel this way because I haven't done something right or somebody hasn't done something right for me. So we never investigate the real reason behind the feeling. And really, this I want to tell you all something I wanted to share. Depression. You will see this in depression where there is a desire that is unmet, a need that is unmet that they don't even know they have. They can't articulate it. And so you get stuck in this funky, weird place. And it's a depressive place, right? You, you just, you're stuck. Because we haven't been given the freedom to actually search, to actually go down and ask those questions, what it is that I need. And our deepest desire, our deepest desire for intimacy means that what I want in life is compassion. I want to flow between each other that is based on a mutual giving of the heart. And that's what intimacy is. It's the meeting of hearts. Um, we long for it. Not just bare feet, bare us, right? That's what we want, vulnerability. And look at this, y'all. We were talking about trees. Uh, Proverbs 12, 13. <laughs> 
this is the scripture where it says, uh, hope deferred makes the heart sad or the heart sick. And it says a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm. Hope deferred, I have to earn it, earn it earn it, and then I'll get it. Deferred, deferred, keep moving the goalposts, keep pushing it out, keep pushing it out. Law, legalism, all that kind of stuff. Where the desire fulfilled is a tree of life. There's a freedom in our desires that are designed within us. See, we look at ourselves and we say, I am not, and I should be, versus looking at ourselves and saying, I need this, and I should need this, right? to be able to be vulnerable, to be able to not live under that judgment. And that's the thing. We slip our needs into judgments and we slip our needs into contract. And so I have to justify my needs and then use justice to get them. And if you break that law, you're going to be judged. Does that make sense? And we look at each other like that. Instead of actually putting it back and investigating on the inside what's going on with us. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 5. This is, this is a pretty cool one. Not that all scripture isn't cool. Um, anyway, uh, <clears throat> this is Paul saying, This is the way any person is to regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of steward, stewards Uh, that one is found trustworthy. But to me, it is an insignificant matter that I would be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even examine myself. For I am unaware of anything against myself. However, I'm not justified by that. But by the one who examines me is the Lord. Now, here we go. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord makes His appearance, who will both bring light to the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives or the counsel or the desires of human hearts, and then praise will come to each person from God. What that is saying is that any judgment of ourselves or or, or of others is out of context apart from seeing Jesus in them. Right? It's always going to be out of context. And so we look at each other. Imagine stopping for a second. Somebody pisses you off. Someone upsets you or whatever. And before you go to judge, like it's time, court is in session, you see Jesus, right? When you look at your spouse, when we look at ourselves, it's the meeting of Jesus, right? That we see Jesus within each other. See, Jesus is the destruction of disappointment. Jesus destroys shame, if he sets us free to be uncovered, to be ourselves. And so I want y'all to know, you are not a disappointment. Your needs are not disappointments. Your desires are not disappointments. They're not. You know, we look at life. Take happiness, for example. Happiness. I want to be happy. You want to be happy? In order to be happy, something has to happen has to happen, right? If it has to happen, it's a requirement. If it's a requirement, then it's a law, right? We're talking about joy. This is why joy is so surprising. Nothing happened. No law was met. This is why peace is beyond our understanding. It's because in the middle of a storm, And life falling apart, none of the conditions for worldly peace has been met, but yet there's peace, right? All the conditions for me to be safe, my back is up against the Red Sea. My ideas of what should happen, I get in defense mode, and what does God do? He splits the sea open. Do you see what I'm saying? He does the things that are not following the rules. He doesn't follow the rules. He doesn't follow the rules. All these rules and expectations and things in our head that go deserve, don't deserve, or earn and don't earn, it's all gone. 
This is the tree of life, baby. You know what I mean? It says this in Philippians, it says, And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We're going to end here. The riches, the, uh, riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Glory. What does glory mean? Opinion. <laughs> so he fulfills all your needs from his opinion of you. What is the opinion of the Father of us? Is he disappointed? Is he disappointed that you are not God? <laughs> They're supposed to be me. <laughs> no. He's not disappointed. See, this is the beauty, and we talked about it last time, that Jesus is the author and perfecter of your childhood. He's the, he in him, all the riches, all the blessings in spiritual places, our needs are met out of his opinion of us, which is love. His banner over you is love. Love, not law. Thank God. Can you imagine? His banner over you is law. <laughs> hey, we're screwed. <laughs> right? But that's not the case. This was never meant to be the story. You see what I mean? This was never meant to be the way that we lived and see one another. We weren't meant to have a snake coiled around our conscience, whispering in our ear that we are not good enough, telling us that we should be disappointed. You're just human. That's disappointing. Do you see what I'm saying? You are just human, and it's a beautiful thing. You do have needs. You do have desires. And you're not meant to, make, uh, to meet them by yourself. He meets our needs according to his opinion of you. So you look at the needs. <laughs> you know, the father said, talks about necessity in the prodigal son. And we'll wrap it up here. So the son goes out, blows the inheritance. Of course, he is judging the hell out of himself, right? He's on his way back, full of judgment. He begins his sinner's prayer, <laughs> right? Because I got to fit what I did into a law, Right? So I begin my sinner's prayer, which comes with repenting really, really hard, being very, very, very sorry. And then giving the person that's going to judge me an idea of how they can do it. <laughs> do you see what I mean? Yeah. Right? So I'm going, to tell, I'm going to tell the father, hey, hey, why don't you make me a servant? You know what I mean? Like I'm going to give you an idea of how to judge me properly out of my shame and my disappointment in myself. And it's amazing. He's practicing this speech. He's got his speech together. He's walking home. He's like, okay, okay, I think I got it. And he goes into his speech. This is after the father embraces him. And you think that'd be enough to realize that this isn't a legal game anymore. But he doesn't. He's embraced. He's loved on. And he goes basically, okay, hold on, Dad. <laughs> you know, I have something to say. And he goes into, oh, I'm this worthless piece of crap. I've sinned against you and against God. And in the middle of that, you'll notice that there was more to the speech that he wasn't able to say. The father cuts him off, and he calls out to the servants. He's killed a fatted calf. We're going to party tonight. Do you see what I mean? In fact, in the message translation, it says, but the father wasn't listening. <laughs> the father doesn't hear the false you. The father doesn't hear the false I am not, and I should be. He doesn't see that. And we all we're, we try to relate to a God who is love out of this place of shame and disappointment and I should be, I should be. Right? We create this false self and try to relate to a God that is real instead of being able to be bare, right? Just me, to be able to come before him, to be, be able to be in relationship with others as just Clint because that's enough. Right? And so he goes and he says, he's killed a fatted calf. Let's go party. So the son is confused, right? You just took me out of the courtroom. You know what I mean? I was on my way. I had my you know, defense ready and I had my evidence or whatever, and I'm going to come and turn myself in, <laughs> right? That's what the son is doing. I'm going to come and turn myself in. Yep, yep, yep. That's what he's doing. And so 
they start go they go in toward the house and the party's getting started. You gotta imagine the confusion on the prodigal son. Like almost hesitant, like are you trying to get in here to, you know, attack me? Like you got something, y'all gonna beat me up inside of this room? And he walks through the door and the music is playing. And the music is playing and the, the house begins to smell like food and all kinds of goodies. And all of a sudden, you're like, okay, is it okay to dance? I mean, is it okay for me to, to party? And then you look and you see the father is spinning around that room harder than anybody else. You see what I mean? Amen. And that's Jesus. Jesus is showing us that the Father is dancing around you and loving you and caring about you. He's not disappointed in you. That is what Jesus has come to give. Why? Because that's the childhood He has with the Father. Do you see what I mean? This isn't about you getting your own little childhood and you're relating to God through all the things you've done right and three things you've done wrong. You're joining the dance that the Son has already established with the Father. You're joining the dance of the Father, Son, and Spirit. That is the participation. Okay, so after that, they're in there dancing. The bro older brother comes up, right? We know the story. Older brother comes up. He's he's been working all day long. He's been doing his thing. He's been do you know he's been following the law to get his needs met, right? So he's following the law. He comes in and he looks at everything going on. He's going, what in the world is going on here? We should not be celebrating this. You can imagine him walking through the door and you're seeing the younger. He's seeing his younger brother, and there's dancing and singing and eating. And he's probably like he's thinking, what in the world? Who allowed y'all to do this? And then all of a sudden, coming around the corner, the father spinning and dancing. Do you see what I mean? He's going, whoa. That's not, that's unlawful. That's not right. And so he steps outside. Remember, he then has lived according to his judgments and begins to judge the father. Like, what are you doing, dad? That's not what you're supposed to do. That's not right. All this time I've been doing this stuff and I can't even get anything out of you. And over here, he's blown your inheritance. He's thrown it all away. And you're throwing a party for him? And that same love... See, both of them were prodigals. <laughs> they both were. Because neither of them saw who the father really was. And what did the father say? He said this was necessary. The party was necessary. I, my God will fulfill all your needs according to his riches and his opinion in Christ Jesus of you. Do you see what I'm saying? Our needs are met in his opinion, his love for us. You hear the babies out there partying. Heck yeah. They're like, shut it down. It's time to move on. But that's at the heart of the Father, right? We've been talking about this childhood that we've lived under the law and trying to earn so much, trying to deal with the disappointment that I'm just Clint. And the, the reality is, is I am the greatest Clint Walker that has ever existed because I'm the only me that's ever existed. All my needs, all my necessities, all of that. And he meets those needs... See that? That, okay, that right there is how we're meant to relate to the Father. Amen. Right? Yes. Right? Let's we are sitting, yeah, that's, that's exactly it. We sitting there and the scripture says we don't know how to pray how we, how we ought. Right? We're sitting there, we think we know our needs, we think our, no, we know our needs, but it says the Spirit intercedes for us, speaking to our spirit that we are children of God, crying out, Abba, Father. Yeah. So you don't know what you need, but the Spirit does, and what does He say? Daddy. Yeah. Do you see it? Okay. <laughs> dad, dad. <laughs> it's perfect. That's it. Wow. That's exactly, that's the heart of the gospel. And we try to deserve and earn and all that, and it's Daddy. Yeah. And Jesus, Jesus is the so love the world of the Father. Hallelujah. He is it. That's the thing. He's not giving us anything. He's give, his gift is Himself. He is the meeting of our needs, that relationship.
And we don't have to be ashamed. We don't have to be disappointed, which means that we don't have to be disappointed with each other. See, this is the biggest, one of the biggest hurdles a lot of times. Like when I'm doing counseling or whatever, you could see the anxiety building and building and building because there's a disappointment, right? There's a disappointment in their selves or the disappointment in what they see, and they're going to come and express it, right? And they're hoping, don't be disappointed in me. Don't be disappointed in me. But the reality is, is that you are loved. You are adopted. You are included. That's at the heart of our relationship. And so judging one another is always out of, conte- out of context without seeing Jesus in them. And all of a sudden you realize this isn't a them problem. This is a me need. And I need to be able to express it without shame, without judgment, because you will never, you'll never get your needs met And if you do get your needs met, it's out of obligation. Mm -hmm. And how many of us want to know that somebody is giving, is relating to me out of obligation? Because that leads to resentment eventually. When when you have to meet my needs out of obligation, it becomes a demand. It's not a request. Therefore, we're not relating. There's not relationship going on. And we can let down those guards. That's the beauty of this message and what it's meant to spread among us as the body of Christ here and there and everywhere is to represent what what humanity has not been able to do is that in Christ we are able to just be us and to be open and to be vulnerable. And then all of a sudden people follow suit, right? When you're open with someone about your vulnerabilities, what happens? It gets reciprocated. Well, what's going on here? Bare hearts are meeting. And it's in that place where healing takes place, where relationship and intimacy grows. Not in the courtroom. We're not in the courtroom anymore. That's all imagination. Like, it literally doesn't exist. There is no courtroom that we're in. And so let's abide by the tree of life where all of our desires are met, where we can participate in love and share with one another everything that we are. And at the heart of it, Jesus says that he's going to sh- he, he came to share what is His with us. We keep trying to get something. <laughs> God's gift is God, right? The Scripture says that He comes to share what He has with us. And in those places where you don't know what you want or you can't see, Asking the Holy Spirit to take what is Jesus's and giving it to you is so important, y'all. Because a lot of times we try to work all this out and we play this mind game. This is not a mind game. This is relationship. And so he has the things that we need and he shares it with us. He takes what is his and gives it to us. He gives us our, you know, his joy that our joy may be full. His peace, what He shares with the Father. It's the finishing of our childhood. It's the perfecting of our childhood. He gives us His. Right? (laughs) Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for this morning. We thank You that at all times, all the spiritual blessings that You have in relationship with Your Father, You freely give us. We thank you that we do not have to live disappointed. We don't have to live in shame and fear. That we can come boldly, boldly to dad to receive the things that we need. We thank you that you are in our presence, that you are inside of us, and we didn't put you there. We thank you that you're loving on us, that you're setting us free. We thank you. We ask you that the eyes of our understanding would continue to be open. Allow us to see what is going on on the inside of us and not be fearful, but to recognize what you are doing and where you are leading on the inside, that the proclamation of the good news go to all parts of us, to bring harmony and to bring love. And we thank you for that. And we live all of life inside of you, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.